With the great German breakthrough halted and then repulsed, it was now the Allies' turn to go on to the offensive. Even the type of warfare began to change as the German defences weakened. But the Germans were far from defeated, and as the Otagos advanced, they still encountered a determined enemy. The last hundred days, the advance to victory of the New Zealand Division was a completely different style of warfare than the siege-like, trench-facing fighting that had gone on for so long. Suddenly it was open and mobile, rapid advances across open fields, unmarked by years of pounding by artillery. It was great really, and it suited the New Zealanders particularly well, they were really good at it. They had to show initiative, they had to move rapidly, they bypassed strong points and advanced quickly and securely across the countryside. It was a war of movement and it seemed to suit our guys uh, for, for whatever reason. Uh, I just think it was, you know, four years of experience, um, practice getting better, uh, improved communications, improved reconnaissance, uh, improved coordination uh, that, that enabled them to, to maximise their input. And I guess it's easier in two important respects as well. One has been an advancing army going forward. The other is, of course, that the German army was now running out of fuff. Uh, that a lot of very young boys were being brought into the front lines to replace the hardened soldiers. And, and so you did have an easier enemy to fight. So you put all that together, you sort of build a momentum and, uh, and, and, and the Otago boys kind of cashed in on that. These fields behind me are the assembly point for the beginning of the New Zealand attack on Bapome on the 24th of August 1918. Now the plan wasn't to go directly in on a full frontal assault on Bapome, it was too heavily defended by the Germans, that would have been suicidal. Instead, different parts of the New Zealand division attack were to go either side, to the north, to the south, and envelop Bapome, forcing the Germans to abandon it and withdraw it. Ultimately, that's what happened, but it took a lot longer and at a much higher cost than was anticipated to begin with. Behind me in the distance you can see the church tower of Barpome, the focus of the attack, but the route round to the northwest here involved the Otagos coming down this ridge between Gravilliers and Beefvilliers, the town you can see over there with another church tower. And on this ridge they were pinned down and seriously mauled by the Germans. This whole row of gravestones record the names of young New Zealand men who fell in the struggle for Bapome on the 24th and 25th of August 1918. The third stone in is that of Lieutenant Colonel Pennycook, the newly appointed young commander of the 2nd Otago Battalion. A fresh-faced young officer, inexperienced, enthusiastic, perhaps too enthusiastic, went too far forward to see what was going on with his men and was killed by the Germans. Illustrating, I suppose, the difficulty of trying to maintain experience and leadership at the same time as replacing all those who had fallen. It was a constant struggle, and Penny Cook was one who fell off the side. Leadership. And again, you read the Otago Battalion or the Otago Regimental History. It speaks volumes for the commanders we had in the front line, leading from the front. Again, I pay tribute to Colonel Hargis, as he was then, pushing the troops forward seizing the initiative and not letting up on the assault on the Germans. I mean, that was the thing. Keep, keep moving. If the Germans are retreating, you don't give them time to retreat, you follow them up. If you're not sure where they are, you go ahead and keep after them till you find them. So, you know, there were places like Fleur, destroyed 1916, fought over again, 1918. It's, it's, it's the, always the attack. It's wanting to bring the war to conclusion. So, and the, the troops responding to that. So they, were, they were a very, very effective fighting force by 1918. Really effective. So while the second Otagos were pinned down on the far side of Bevilliers in the distance there and decimated, losing 100 men, including their commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Pennycock, 
Their sister battalion, the 1st Otagos, were advancing towards us along the road here in the morning mist, cloaked by it, supported by tanks and doing pretty well. Until they got to this point, the mist lifted, the tanks were knocked out and they were pinned down by machine gun fire coming directly towards them from Monument Wood on the far side of the road. They went to ground and were pinned down here for a considerable time. Just behind me you can see Monument Wood. It was the German machine guns in there that stopped the 1st Otago's advance on Bapaum on the morning of 25th of August 1918. But later in the day, after a heavy artillery barrage of the German positions, the 1st Otago stormed through the wood and made further progress towards Bapaum. You can also actually see some of the buildings of Bapaum in the distance towards the right behind me. Now, it doesn't look very far away, but as the military historian Glenn Harper says, that mile was going to be one of the longest and bloodiest in New Zealand's military history. Having broken through the great German entrenchment of the Hindenburg Line, the next significant obstacle was the Beau Revoir Manier Line, a couple of kilometres over to my left. But in between was the St Quentin Canal. Now the Otagos came up against this on the left bank over there on the 30th of September. They were pinned down, there was no crossing point and on the far side here was 20 or more German machine guns all in place. Pinned them down, held up the advance for quite a time. This is quite a beautiful part of the French countryside showing few signs of the wear and tear of warfare in 1918. But nonetheless, as the fighting raged along here on the St Quentin Canal, there was damage done. And behind me you can see part of the 12th century Cistercian Monastery at Vaucelles, founded in fact by St Bernard, partially destroyed during the French Revolution and further wrecked by the First World War, including the fighting by the New Zealanders along the canal here. Part of the damage inflicted here was all ours. And then, having crossed the St Quentin Canal, this was it, the last formidable barrier, the last great German defensive line to the east. The trenches ran up here on either side of the road and around the farm at the head. There was lots of wire and it was expected this would be a really hard nut to crack, but it didn't prove so. In the pre-dawn darkness of the 8th of October, the 2nd New Zealand Brigade, including the two Otago battalions, advanced across here, cut the wire, very little German reaction, they were demoralised, they pulled back, advanced through to the Palu Wood over to my left, cleared trenches to the east of the village of Leydan behind me, and then the way was open eastward and the advance thereafter was increasingly rapid. Following Bapaum, German resistance remained but it became increasingly sporadic. It's difficult in modern times to track the Otago's progress during these battles, due to the rapid pace at which the advances were made. Somewhat controversially, a conscription bill had been passed into law in New Zealand in August 1916. This called men up for military service whether they wanted to go or not. And it was these fresh troops, continually coming over from New Zealand, that kept the Otagos well stocked with new men even as they suffered major casualties. This proved to be a major difference at the end in 1918 between them and their alien German foe who was simply running out of new men. Uh, well it was necessary in the sense that if New Zealand wanted to play a full part in the war as it did it needed to have a, f uh, a fully functioning division there the whole time and in order to have the manpower to do that, yes, there had to be conscription. And I think the Australian example showed that conscription was necessary because Australia um, suffered a wee bit by not having it. It changed the composition of our troops. I mean, our early volunteers in 1914 and 15 were sort of the bachelor class, the confirmed bachelors whom society could probably afford to lose. It's a brutal thing to say, but your men in the mid-twenties, as I've said, who are labourers, who have no family ties, for them to depart, it doesn't really affect their demographics a great deal. Conscription comes in, and that's when the government starts to go back through the community and strip out the married men. Then the married men with one child, two children, and three children. You know, by 1918, you're really starting to go back through the community and pick out the, some of the older men and the men with more family responsibilities. And that had a greater impact. Again, Pugsley argues that's why 
we did actually a lot better in 1918 than most other armies. Uh, even the Canadians, although they had conscription, went, wasn't very effective. And they went topped up the same way the Australians really struggled through 1917 and 18 because of lack of men. So the fact that we were a constant division of 20,000 fighting men in the field uh, helps explain why we did so well. And of course, the Otago's got a bit muddled up, including my own uncle, who was an Aucklander, who, who fought with them for a wee bit before he ended up with the New Zealand Rifles. Uh, so you had people from all over the place by that time, so we have to be a wee bit careful about being parochial here. Uh, it was less of an Otago unit than it had been in 1915. You know, the New Zealand Division had a reputation as being, uh, as being one of the best, and certainly one of the most complete in terms of numbers, and I think that was be partly because of conscription. After nearly three years of active fighting in the trenches, the Otagos were now consistently getting the better of their German foes. How then did the Germans view these colonial troops? The general impression seems to be that they thought we were good, competent, well-organised, brave soldiers uh, and not to be underestimated. Otago developed a reputation as being, as part of the New Zealand division, you know, those colonial troops, as the German recognised, good fighters, good in defence, strong in attack and not known for taking prisoners. And here's the famous spot where the New Zealand Division ended the war with such a great story. Approaching the walled town of La Kenoi, everybody was afraid that it would have to be destroyed, this fine, ramparted town. But Lieutenant Averill of the New Zealand Rifle Brigade, scouting around, popped a scaling ladder up against the wall just behind me over here, and he and his men filed over the top of the ramparts, broke open the siege, the Germans gave up, town was liberated without being destroyed and New Zealanders became forever after here in the Kinoi the great liberators, the great heroes. And here on the rampart walls of the Kinoi, just along from where Lieutenant Averill put up the scaling ladder and began the liberation of this town is this lovely memorial to the New Zealanders which says in honour of the men of New Zealand whose valour restored to France, the Kenoi, on the 4th of November, 1918. And down in front, the standard inscription from the uttermost ends of the earth, which encapsulates so much about the Otago's journey, even though they weren't the men who liberated this town. Still, like all the New Zealanders, they came from as far away as you could come. They gave their blood, and often cases, they gave their lives to liberate France, to liberate Belgium, and they're honoured today here by the people whose land they served. While the taking of Le Quinoa was a high point for the New Zealand Division to finish its war on, it was not the place of the final battles of the Otagos. Rather, the Otago mounted rifles were busy reconnoitring ground in the Mormal Forest to the northeast of Le Quinoa, and it was there the Otago Infantry Battalions fought their last actions of the war. 5th of November 1918 was the last active day of the war for the Otago Regiment. Their task on that day was to clear the Mormal Forest here, starting from the west and moving right through the east. Canterbury's were moving off to their left, Otago's to the right. They started in the early dawn. It was in driving rain, quite dark and disorientating the forest, artillery pounding, cacophonous. But nonetheless, they met relatively little resistance until they reached this house and there was a real fight on around here in which two of the officers, nine of the men, were killed, the last active combat casualties of the war for the Otago Regiment. The CO of the 2nd Battalion, Lieutenant Colonel James Hargist of Invercargill, was almost killed when a shell took out the front of the building after he made it his HQ. It gave him quite a fright. Nonetheless, by late in the afternoon, the Otagos had reached the eastern edge of the forest, cleared it, completed their task, they brought the nine, 11 bodies back here, placed them reverently by the building, and with that, the act of fighting the war was over. The Otagos were finishing the clearing out of the forest of Mormal when word reached them of the signing of the armistice on the 11th of November 1918. It was anticlimactic, and there was little celebration among the ranks. The battalion simply returned to the Quinoa where they were told 
the war is over.